this morning, I want to bring a word. And Pastor Ronald has asked the preaching team to go in a little bit of a different direction at the moment. And he wants us to go back and revisit evangelism. So today the topic is why evangelize part one. You know, have you ever wondered why we share the gospel? Why do we evangelize? Has anyone ever struggled with sharing their faith with others before? See your hands. Anyone struggled? A couple of people? Yeah, there's a few people, right? Now, for those same people that have said, you know, yeah, I have struggled to share the gospel, maybe the reason is because you feel that people don't want to hear what you have to say or maybe you've been attacked verbally or physically. You know, I've seen a couple of YouTube clips where people are being attacked just for preaching the gospel. It's hard to imagine. But also I saw one gentleman that got shot just for preaching the gospel. Now, the main reason I believe that is usually is because the people are, uh, are under the conviction of the Holy Spirit as they're hearing the message. And there's obviously darker forces behind the scenes. So the main reason we reach out to others is simply because every person counts and matters to God. Would you agree? Amen. You know, they may not count or matter to you, especially if you've shared the gospel with them. Maybe they swore at you or maybe they ignore you now. But the point is they do matter to God because God died for all of mankind, not just a select few. You know, I remember on one occasion I was sharing the gospel out in Frankston. For those that live in Frankston, yeah, praise God. You know, I was led to speak to this one particular guy and not bagging Frankston, of course, because, you know, we love all places, right? But I remember I was, uh, I was sharing the gospel there and there was this one particular guy that, you know, he, he knew why I was there and he was trying to avoid me and he was rough looking. And, you know, as I started sharing with him, I just found out that he had just been released from prison. Now, as I was sharing the gospel with him, he was, you know, listening, but he was looking down. Do you know what I mean? He was just looking down and he was listening. But, um, and as I finished and I asked him, I said, do you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life now? Now, this young man who was rough looking looked at me and said, hey, God wouldn't accept someone like me. God doesn't care about someone like me, especially with what all I've done. And he ran a long list of all the bad things that he had done. And I said to him, God does care for you. God does love you. And he died on the cross for you. And more importantly, he sent me here tonight to share the gospel with you. That's how much he loves you. But see, this young man had already made up his mind that he didn't want to accept Jesus. And he made up his mind that he didn't qualify because of all the bad and all the wrong stuff that he had done. Now, even if he didn't think that he qualified, he does qualify because, again, God loves every single person person why john three sixteen states this for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life you know our role is not to try to work out who deserves to hear the message or how to share the message now our role is to go forth and to preach the gospel as jesus commanded his disciples now, people then often ask, well, what's the best method or how do I reach out to people? What do I say? They say this because, you know, they say, I'm too scared to share with strangers or family members. I don't know what to say to people. Or, you know, what if they ask me hard questions and I don't know how to respond? Or what if I offend them? And the list goes on and on. For those that can remember a while ago, we also did the Connect Group studies. And in that, we did the many methods and the many approaches as to how to evangelize, such as the random approach, relationship evangelism, lifestyle evangelism, intellectual approach, and again, the list goes on. So this morning, I want to share an approach that I think we can all use and apply in our everyday lives as we look back and see how the early church reached out and impacted their generation. So I'm referring to the book of Acts. The book of Acts documents a pivotal era in the transformation in the unity and the resilience of the believers. It also tells of stories of ordinary individuals who were empowered by a profound vision and an undefined mission to bring about an extraordinary change in their generation. You know, their efforts in spreading the gospel message, performing supernatural acts of healing, 
unwavering message in seemingly impossible circumstances that also offers timeless lessons for you and I today. So by drawing on the parallels between the early church's experience and even today's events, we can obtain powerful insights into effective evangelism and community building strategies. Now, just as the apostles in Acts responded to their you know, world with their boldness and their conviction, we too can address our modern day challenges with a similar determination. In exploring these connections, we find that the principles of evangelism and healing, they're not just historical artifacts, but they're relevant practices even for us today. So as we look back through the book of Acts, we are also encouraged to engage in these same actions that bring about unity, inspire hope and belief in the possibility of extraordinary outcomes. The book of Acts, or Acts of the Apostles, has explicit details on the early church's birth, especially in the time and the era that we're living in, which kind of would have looked similar to what they were going through. Believers today, we can also draw on these valuable lessons from this period in Christian history. The book of Acts serves as a timeless guide, showing us how to engage in effective evangelism minister healing, and cultivate a faith that trusts God for the supernatural. So by visiting, these, uh, by visiting these, the boldness, the unity, and the miraculous works recorded in the book of Acts, we too can find inspiration and practical strategies to navigate our practical and our contemporary world. The apostles' unwavering commitment to spreading the gospel message their compassion to heal the sick, and their unshakable faith in God's power and ability should challenge you and I to also rise to the occasion and the challenges that we face in our world. So in a world filled with uncertainty and need, the principles that are found in the book of Acts should empower you and I to become modern-day witnesses that demonstrates Jesus' love and power advancing his kingdom with the same passion and faith as the early church did. So how do these disciples, who were just mere ordinary men, how did they change and impact the culture of their day? How was it possible? Well, it was only made possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's have a look at Acts chapter 1, verses 4. Now, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. You know, if you and I are to be victorious in our lives, as the disciples were in the book of Acts, we can't live our life in our own strength and in our own ability. We got to do what Jesus told the disciples to do, which was to wait until they had received the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus instructed the disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit as he had promised them before they were to move out and do their own things because what they were about to do and face was only made possible through them being empowered by the Holy Spirit. What about you and I who we can't also move out. We can't do our own thing and operate in our own strength apart from being empowered with the Holy Spirit. So we too need to wait to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit is the power that we need to overcome our circumstances in our everyday life. So today, if you're here and if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, we can get that sorted out because today you don't need to wait as the disciples had to wait because the, the, the Holy Spirit has already been poured out on the day of Pentecost. So what happened when the, when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, let's have a look at Acts chapter 1, verses 8. It says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, you too will receive power. You know, the word power in the Greek is dunamis, which is where we get the word in English for dynamite. You know, one of the many other meanings of this word power that we received are as follows. 
When we receive power, we receive strength from the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel boldly. We receive the ability to work miracles in confirmation to the word. We also receive courage and greatness of mind amidst all reproaches and persecutions that we face. We also receive the ability to face all opposition and all our enemies and overcome them all. We also receive the ability to profess the name of Jesus, abide by his truths and ordinances, no matter what circumstances you're facing. You also have the ability to make your way through all opposition and all difficulties and overcome them. And we also have the ability to spread the gospel message throughout the entire world. You know, again, these are just some of the attributes of the great power of the Holy Spirit that you and I have received. So have you received this great and awesome power? If not, again, we can sort that out at the end of today. You know, this power that we receive will cause you to step out of your comfort zone, meaning that you won't even know yourself. What I mean by that is this. You know, I'm more of a behind-the-scenes kind of a person. I'm not used to, you know, being up here. This is not my natural ability to be up here on stage in front of you. But when I received the Holy Spirit, I was empowered with His boldness to do this, and not only this, but to go out into the streets and to share the gospel. So too with you. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you too can do great exploits for God. So today I have three points that I want to share from the book of Acts that we can practically apply in our everyday lives. Point number one, we can bring and minister healing. Acts chapter 3, verses 6 to 8. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. So the early church's uh, ministry of healing demonstrated God's compassion and healing. Today, believers are also encouraged to pray for and minister to the sick, trusting in God's ability to bring about physical, emotional, and spiritual healing. You know, at times we, we read how God brings people to himself by providing the ways and the means to himself, meaning that through God's demonstration of healing, it brings people to salvation. You know, the, miracle, the miraculous healing is a direct demonstration of God's power and compassion that reinforces the gospel message. In Acts chapter 9, verses 32 and 33, it states that as Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. So we see here the healing of Ananias led to many people in the region of Lydda turning to the Lord. The act of healing not only transformed Ananias' life, but also the supernatural witness that impacted the broader community within that area. Such acts of healing encourage believers to have faith in God's ability to heal and also to step out in faith and to pray for other people. You know, we should be actively looking and praying for those who are sick or suffering, believing in God's power to heal them. So how we demonstrate God's love is through actions, practically meeting people's needs. You know, I remember one time that I shared with you at a previous workplace how I shared the gospel with this particular lady whose daughter was home and ill. You know, her daughter was sick at home, and after hearing me share the gospel message with one of her work colleagues, she asked me to pray for her daughter, who was sick at home and bedridden. So I said, yes, no worries. So I prayed a simple prayer, and I said to her, there's no distance in prayer. And we prayed, and I said, it's done, and I believe, God, that God has healed your daughter. Now, I just, you know, went about my day, and I, and I saw her about a couple of days later, because I'm a rep on the road, so I came back into the office, and as I saw her, she came running to me in tears, saying, thank you so much, my daughter was healed. And I said, praise God, and we rejoiced together. And she said, yeah, she goes, I rang my husband after you left, and she said that uh, her husband said that her daughter was up and, you know, playing and eating. Well, he said that was really odd, because prior to that, she had been bedridden, not eating for days. 
But after we prayed, after we stood in agreement at work, he said that, um, yeah, she basically said that her daughter was healed. And he said that, and, and so she asked, what time was this that, you know, she was, was healed? And it was the exact time that we prayed at work. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, so as a result of meeting her physical need by her daughter being healed, God was able to meet their need and they were able to encounter the living God. Now, prior to this, they were a Muslim family, but they had an encounter with God through him meeting their physical need and they couldn't deny that Jesus is God. You know, they came to salvation in Jesus and this should be an everyday event in the life of the believer because we have all been empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit. Point number two is to boldly evangelize and to share the gospel. Acts chapter 4, 29 to 31. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak the word with boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word boldly. You know, the believers in the book of Acts can relate to being persecuted. They were threatened, they were beaten, they were killed for their faith in Jesus. You know, believers today, we can draw inspiration from the apostles' boldness and fearlessness in sharing the gospel. You know, even in the face of opposition, this encourages us, you and I, to step out boldly in faith and share the gospel. Sharing the message of Jesus in our communities, in our workplace, and even beyond. You know, the world wants to muzzle the believer today. You know, in a lot of places, you can't share the gospel. And for those that can remember a while ago, we tried to get a, a booth at the local shopping center. And, you know, we had countless of meetings with them about, you know, what we could say, what we couldn't say, how we are to promote, you know, the church. And, and I remember them saying, because you're a religious organization, they made us jump through all these hoops. And we just simply said it wasn't worth us even doing that. And, you know, I also remember another time that we wanted to share the gospel. This was a while ago on the streets of Maribyrnong. And over there, you have to get a, a permit from the council. And you have to also have a meeting with them. And you have to tell them what you're doing, what pamphlets you're handing out, what you're saying. And we just thought, again, it's not even worth going out there. So we just did it privately one-on-one. -on -one. But, you know, these are just some of the, you know, hurdles and the obstacles that you and I have to face in order to get the gospel message. But it shouldn't deter us from getting out there and sharing the gospel. You know... I don't know about you, but you notice that the name of Jesus brings conflict and it causes an uproar. Has anyone ever... You can say anything else, but the minute you say the name of Jesus, man, everything changes, right? Now, why is that? Well, let's have a look at Acts chapter 4, verses 12. And while you do that, I'm just going to take a sip of water. Acts chapter 4, verses 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Have you ever noticed that when famous people get interviewed and they say, oh, I believe in God, you know, most of them don't say, I believe in Jesus. There are some, but most of them say, I believe in God. Now, to you and I, that could mean anything, right? But his very name, Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us, or Yeshua, God is salvation. No other name, no other person can offer salvation except through the name of Jesus. So this verse here prior in the book of Acts was made in response to the religious leaders who were questioning the authority and the power by which John and Peter had healed the man. Peter's boldness in proclaiming Jesus as the only source of salvation reveals the truth of the gospel message, which is Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. So you know that you're on the right track when you're preaching and you get opposition when you mention the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 5, 29 to 32, Peter and the apostles demonstrated their boldness in preaching the gospel. So even in the face of persecution and opposition and threats by religious authorities, they prioritized their obedience to God rather than human opposition emphasizing their role as being a witness of Jesus' resurrection and power 
and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we too must equip ourselves with a solid understanding of the gospel message and ask God for the courage and the boldness to share our faith with other people. We need to trust in the Holy Spirit to guide our words and seek opportunities to build relationships with non-believers so we can demonstrate the love of Jesus in all our interactions. Bold evangelism not only spreads the message of salvation, but it also challenges social norms that promote spiritual transformation and also builds communities of faith. By following these examples, the early church in the book of Acts, believers today can actively participate in fulfilling the great commission that Jesus commanded us to, making disciples of all nations through fearless proclamation of the gospel message. Point number three, having unwavering faith in God's power. Acts chapter 12, verses 5 to 7. So Peter was kept in prison by the church, was, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before, Herod was in, was, uh, was bring to, sorry, Herod was, uh, Herod was to bring him to trial. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and centurions stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains of Peter's wrist fell off. The book of Acts is filled with plenty of examples of believers who trusted in God for the impossible, for the supernatural. Today, we are also called to have this same unwavering faith for God to do the supernatural in your life. Believing that God can and will move powerfully in your life and within your circumstances. See, as believers, we shouldn't hold back in fear. We should press forward and advance the kingdom of God. You know, we need to be strong in our convictions and we need to stand up for what is right. Together, we are powerful. United, we stand. But the enemy, unfortunately, brings division with us, trying to separate us. But what happened recently, as an example, with the Olympic Games? You know, we discussed this with our young adults and every Christian should have been appalled with what they did. They made a mockery of the Last Supper and they depicted Jesus in a disrespectful way. You know, many people took to social media and, you know, they said that what they had done was abhorrent. But could you imagine what what would have happened if they did this to other religious and other religious figures? They wouldn't dare do that to other religious figures, right? So as believers, we need to take a stand for what is right and be bold about our convictions. The book of Acts is about believers coming out and being bold and standing up for their faith in Christ. They were threatened, they were beaten, they were stoned and they were killed. Yet that never stopped them from spreading the gospel message. Now I'm not saying that we need to go out there and get beaten for our faith or, you know, stoned to prove a point. What I am saying is that we need to be obedient and listen to the Holy Spirit and do what he's telling us to do. We have been given the Holy Spirit to be empowered, to be bold witnesses for him. So think about where you are in life and those that God has placed within your life. Ask the Holy Spirit how you can impact those around you with the gospel message. God will give you insight and direction. You know, one word can change and impact a person's life. In a world that is very anti-God and very anti-faith, we need to believe God for the supernatural. God wants to do the impossible. He wants to establish his kingdom, and more importantly, he wants to use you and I to do it. God's will is that none shall perish, but that all shall come to the knowledge of the truth. God loves every person, and he died for all of humanity. So as I close this morning, and as I get the worship team to come up, you know, you may be here this morning, and you may may be saying to God, God, what can I do? I'm just one person. Yeah, I'm not a pastor. I'm not confident, you know, getting up and public speak or, you know, I'm not confident with sharing the gospel. If that's you, then you're the perfect candidate. God is not looking for perfection. God is not looking for ability. God is looking for availability and he's looking for the right heart.
So what is the impact that one person who is filled with the Holy Spirit, what can they do? Well, just think about the impact that one person filled with the Holy Spirit can make in the lives of people. For example, we all know this particular person being Pastor Ronald, okay? Now, his life was changed and impacted by making a simple decision to follow Jesus. And his life was changed and his life has been impacted as a result. God then led him here to Australia and he has now impacted countless of lives here in Australia and around the world to which you all here can attest to. Your life has now been impacted and the ripple effect continues. That's the impact that one person that's been filled with the Holy Spirit can make. So again, if that's you and you're saying to God, but what can I do? I'm just one person. Here's what you can say instead. Here you can say, here I am, Lord. Use and send me. God is saying, trust him. Rely on the same Holy Spirit that the disciples trusted in. Trust in the same dudamous power that was on and in Jesus. Trust in Him and be available and He will fill your mouth and He will give you the words to speak. Speak to others in our church who go out every week to share the gospel, such as Caleb, Emma, Gina and the team. They will be glad for you to go out with them to get the experience and to go out and to share the gospel with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Being available to the Holy Spirit is the key to overcoming and being bold witnesses for Him in order for us to change and impact our community and our generation. Can we stand this morning as we worship the King of Kings? Amen? Amen. Praise God.